Um, some of you may know this. My, my wife, Jenny, comes from a really large family. Her dad is one of 12 kids. Uh, Jenny, then, is one of 58 grandchildren, and it gets even better. My three children are three of over 130 great-grandkids, right? This, this is, it's true. This is Jenny's side of the family. Now, Grandma and Grandpa, sadly, have both passed away, which means we don't get together as a family much anymore. But I can remember when Jenny and I were dating. And we would go to her grandma and grandpa's house in northwest Ohio, and we'd be there for like Thanksgiving or Christmas. Uh, grandma and grandpa had like four or five couches in their living room because they expected large crowds. And we'd go there, and if you were lucky, you'd plant yourself in a seat and keep it for the rest of the day. And I'd sit there with Jenny and people, it was just like a revolving door all day long. People coming into grandma and grandpa's house, and every once in a while I'd lean over to Jenny and say, hey, who's that? And she'd say, oh, that's such and such. But every once in a while, she'd shrug her shoulders and say, I have no idea. It's probably a cousin or something like that. Thankfully, she did not grow up near most of them. Otherwise, I'm just saying, you have to be careful about who you dated right? I mean, wouldn't, isn't it just kind of true? Like before he got too far down the road, maybe a little ancestry.com just to be safe. Well, last week we kicked off a little bit of an intro to this new series about family, one that we're calling the people of God. And for the next few months, we're going to work our way through the second book of the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, a historical book that tells the story of Israel, a family of 12 that eventually grew into a really large nation. And as we're going to discover together, what made this family special wasn't its size, but it was the fact that God chose them and he set them apart to be his people. And throughout the series, as we read, we're going to learn that what was true of the Israelites then is true for anyone who surrenders their life to Jesus today. That when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, like you're adopted into God's family, which means that all of us, every one of us who have put our faith and trust in the Lord, that have trusted Jesus with our lives, we get to share in the joy and the responsibility of also being known as the people of God. And you know how biological family members tend to resemble one another. I mean, moms and dads, if you, if you have kids, you, you know, you, you, your kid might look like you. Well, people will see the resemblance in them. I remember when I was a teen, people would tell me that I looked like my mom. Now I love my mom. I think she's one of the most beautiful people on the inside. And now no teenage boy wants to be told that they look like their mother. But I get it now. Like now it's a compliment. Now I understand as Christians as followers of Jesus in Genesis Church, like our goal ought to be to live a life that resembles more and more of Jesus every single day in everything that we do because we want others to, to know Jesus and we want them to see him and to see him in us and to experience the love of Christ in and through our actions, and certainly as a church family. And so if you have a Bible today, I want to invite you to take it and turn uh, to the second book of the Bible, to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 1. Again, it's the second book right after Genesis. Uh, here's a fun resource somebody showed me last week. We put this on social media this past week. Uh, they're called Scripture Journals. Uh, there's one for the book of Exodus, and, and it's kind of a fun piece in that if you can see this or not, you get the text on one side, and then you get a whole page for notes on the other side. So if you're somebody that loves to study, if you're somebody that loves to take notes, uh, you might consider picking one of these up. This is in the ESV. ESV can be a great resource, especially uh, for study. It's kind of fun. The other piece I want to remind you of is our reading plan. And we've got these in the back of the room and they're just outside the door. But the People of God reading plan where you can read through the book of Exodus with us over the next few months. Again, so you're kind of engaging and learning on your own, coming up with your own questions. I'm learning. I've never done a study of the book of Exodus, so this is kind of a, a first time for me and maybe for some of you. So check that out. But Exodus chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, let's open this together. Here's what we read. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Israel and Jacob are two names for the same guy. 
All right, we're talking about the same person here because as we learn in the book of Genesis, Israel or Jacob was the father of 12 sons, all who represent the 12 tribes of Israel as listed here in these first few verses. But there's also something else that doesn't show up in the English translations that's kind of fun because in the original Hebrew text, the first word of Exodus chapter 1 verse 1 is actually the word and, A-N-D. And that's important as it's meant to provide a connection. It's meant to link the two together. They're meant to be read together from one to the next and really the first five books of the Bible for that matter. Verse 5, the descendants of Jacob or Israel numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now, we don't know for sure whether this number 70 is a precise number or more of a symbolic number, likely a symbolic number because in the Bible, the number 70 can also mean ideal or significant. It's a number of completion. The point trying to be made is that all of Israel can currently be accounted for in the nation of Egypt but why were they in Egypt in the first place? What in the world are they doing there? Well, if you remember from the book of Genesis, uh, towards the end of the book, through a crazy series of events, Joseph was sold in slavery. Uh, This is Joseph and and the coat guy, sold into slavery, ended up in Egypt through a crazy series of events. He's going to end up becoming the second in charge of the land, really the, the prime minister. And over a period of time, the remainder of his family would even eventually migrate to Egypt looking for refuge from a very uh, serious famine. And so according to scholars, they didn't leave. They made their home there. And just to give you some idea from a map, here's a a picture of the nation of Egypt back then and kind of shaded in green in the center of the screen is this area called Goshen or the Nile Delta region where likely the people of Israel would have set up shop. This is where they made their home. Verse 6, time passes. Now Joseph and all his brothers and that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. This is kind of like what's happening in Gen Kids right now here at our church, right? They are growing. There are kids everywhere, all over the place. It's a good thing. But seriously, it seems that Moses is trying to get our attention about something. There's something about the words you can see there in the text, exceedingly, multiplied, increased, Numerous, this family's growing, and that's a fulfillment of what God had promised would happen in the book of Genesis. Because in Genesis 1, 28, God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And then later, God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, he said, I'm going to make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And now it's a few hundred years later, Exodus chapter 1. Moses is showing us, I believe, how God kept his promise to Abraham. That even through the difficulties, even through the ups and downs, even through the uncertainty and all of the changing circumstances, that God is still working and that nothing is going to stand in his way. This past week I couldn't help but think about Uh, being reminded of the planning and preparations that we were doing in our church going way back to 2020. Some of you were here with us. We we recognized that we were starting to outgrow this facility, and so we made the decision that it was time to start planning for a more permanent location uh, for this campus. So we had lots of conversations as a church family. We were getting some help from some outside groups. We launched a special giving event to help raise funds, and then COVID hit. We all remember that, and none of us knew what was going to happen, and it was frustrating. It was frustrating as a church. It was frustrating uh, personally. It was confusing, but God was faithful. 
He was faithful from beginning to end. He is always faithful, and he brought our church through it. He led us through it. We were able to exceed some of our financial goals through that. True, he hasn't directed or revealed a more permanent facility yet for this campus, but unlike four years ago, we're in a much stronger position financially. I think we're in a really healthy place as a church family as God is growing us together. We're, we're in a position now that if something became available, we could seriously consider it in the meantime time though this is our home this is where he has us and isn't it true like just like for Israel or just like for our church you know life doesn't always go as planned you know that you got your own story life doesn't always go as we planned as we hoped for you know God if you think about it God made all of these promises to the people of Israel and then they ended up in Egypt And as we're going to see in a moment, things are going to get really difficult for them. And in its own unique way, I mean, maybe that's true of your life today. Maybe that's part of your story because if uh, you're in a job, a job that you hope for, a job that you moved here for, but it ain't going as planned, or you didn't get into your first choice school or grad school, or you thought for sure healing and recovery were right around the corner, whether it be in your life or somebody that you love, or marriage is harder than you anticipated, or you hope that he was the one or she was the one, and they're not. I'm not saying that it will be easy. I'm not saying that at all. But just because it's hard doesn't mean he's not working. And just because you're uncomfortable right now doesn't mean he's absent. And whatever it is, no matter how difficult it may be as we're going to see these next months together, keep trusting. There is nothing that is going to stand in the way of his plans. And one of those themes that we're going to see played out in Exodus has to do with God and his character and specifically his faithfulness. Because again, nothing will stand in his way. Verse 8. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. And so the Israelites had enjoyed this time of peace in Israel. This was a great home, waterfront property, you know, along the Nile region. And so under the former leader, things were great, things were fine. But then this new king comes aboard, and he's got no reason to extend them any favor at all whatsoever, nothing special. In fact, he felt threatened by them. He was afraid that one day they might rebel against Egypt and so in fear and hatred he came up with a plan. Verse 11, he put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. Uh, labor. They built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for, for Pharaoh. So he turned them into slaves. He oppressed them and then it's going to get worse we read. Verse 12 but the more they were oppressed the more they multiplied and spread so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites, work them ruthlessly They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. But go back to the beginning there for just a second because what does it say in verse 12? The more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied. Why were the Israelites multiplying in such great numbers? I'm going to give you a hint. It's not because they were oppressed. It's further evidence of God's promise. Because what did God promise? He promised that he would make them into a great nation, which means that nothing is going to stand in the way of his plans. But it raises another question. If God's responsible for the multiplication, who's behind the persecution? Another hint. It's not Pharaoh. He's just a puppet. Because here's what we need to see. And what you need to keep in mind as you're reading and studying through your own. This story that's playing out in Exodus is indeed, it is true. It's a historical book. It's a history of the nation of Israel coming together at the same time. It's also a picture of the spiritual battle that has been raging on this earth since the very beginning. God was there. Adam and Eve were there. And who else showed up? A serpent. A snake. In his commentary on the book of Exodus, Philip Ryken 
explains how despite their fear of snakes, the ancient Egyptians were actually drawn to worship them, that serpents in particular uh, were a part of worship in this Nile Delta region where the Israelites lived. And it was there, in fact, that the Egyptians built a great temple to honor their snake goddess, Wajet, who was represented by the hieroglyphic sign of the cobra. And so many of the pharaohs believed that she was responsible, that she was the one that helped them find their way to power. And so one ancient manuscript reveals that when Pharaoh first ascended the throne in Egypt, he would take the royal crown and say this, these words, O great one, O magician, O fiery snake, let there be terror of me like the terror of thee. Let there be fear of me like the fear of thee. Let there be awe of me like the awe of thee. Let me rule a leader of the living. Let me be powerful, a leader of spirits. Here's what I find so fascinating about this. Exodus, yes, it is true, is a story about Israel and an evil Pharaoh. But it's more than that. This is God versus Satan. And specifically, Satan's attempt to disrupt God's plan to eventually send his son, Jesus Christ, to this world through the nation of Israel, specifically this family that is currently caught up in slavery in Egypt. Again, let's keep this reality in mind as we read and as we study together and also be aware that this same spiritual battle continues today. That just as Satan will go to great lengths to destroy the people of God in Exodus, he continues this assault today against you and me, against anyone who will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And just like we see in Exodus, Satan will do everything that he can to discourage and destroy your faith and my faith, but also disrupt and distract us from the work that we've been called to do, our work for Jesus Christ, or as we like to say around here, the work of helping people find their way back to God. Now, if you keep reading through the end of chapter 1, you'll find that Pharaoh's hatred towards the Israelites escalates from slaver, slavery and hard labor to also murder and infanticide. Verse 22, then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Can you imagine the horror? of living during such a day. Like put yourself in the shoes of an expectant mother or father. There are no ultrasounds back then. You've got nine months of waiting and anticipating, wondering, will it be a boy or will it be a girl? And so consider the impact of this on everyone's morale. Imagine what it was doing to God, because we can see his heart in this story too. But here's something else. Amid the slavery and murder and terror, Exodus chapter 1 ends with a very clear sense that the people need a rescuer. They need a savior, someone who understands their troubles and someone who is capable of setting them free. Enter Moses. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, which my parents ran up against this all the time when they had me. People would say, look, he has such a fine child you have there. Some of you know that. But no, he was a fine child. She hid him for three months, again, because of what was going on with the baby boys in Egypt. But when she couldn't hide him any longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Verse 5. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slaves to get it. She opened it, saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went, got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. 
So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Man, what courage. You know, courage for what many believe to be Moses' sister. Uh, Courage by Moses' mother to keep him, to protect him, to present him in this moment and God rewarded their faithfulness and courage in some really extraordinary ways because not only was this baby boy's life spared but mom was also able do you see that in the text to care for him to nurse him for a period of time and then turn him over so he could be raised and educated right under the nose of Pharaoh how about the irony there how about that for a crazy turn of events Jump ahead for just a second if you've got your Bibles to the New Testament if you want. Um, Exodus, or excuse me, Acts chapter 7, all right? This is a thousand years later, but I want to show you something here that, that's good, provides some additional details for us. Acts chapter 7, we would have looked at this in the fall as we, or no, excuse me, last winter, spring as we worked through the book of, of Acts together. Stephen is giving this grand speech, if you would, recalling the story of Moses to a group of people. And look how he describes Moses' time of growing up in Egypt. uh, Acts 7, verse 22, it says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. And so again, Stephen gives us a little insight to some things that aren't included in Exodus chapter 2. He tells us that Moses grew up amongst the Egyptians, and during that time he became powerful in speech and action, which is kind of interesting, as we'll talk about next week. He also mentions an event that took place when Moses was 40 years old, which we read about here. All right, back to Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. One day after Moses had grown up, how old was he? He was 40 years old. Ladies, if you have a 30-year-old husband that hasn't grown up yet, you still got time, right? You got another 10 years, all right, for, for them to grow up. But it says when he was 40, when he had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. I want you to notice the repetition of the phrase, his own people. Man, what's this beginning to tell us? It's beginning to tell us and reveal that even though he grew up in the Egyptian palace, he knew he was different. He knew there was something different about himself, that he was an Israelite. After watching on the sidelines for 40 years, this brutality, he knew something needed to be done. One day, he finally jumps into action. He's going to kill an Egyptian slave master and bury the body in the sand, and he can't help but wonder why. Like, after so many years, what got into him and why now? Verse 13. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian where he sat down by a well. Moses saw his people's Uh, pain and suffering, and and it moved him to action. And we don't know how and we don't know when, but somehow Moses realized his true identity as as a Hebrew, as an an Israelite, and at some point he made a decision who he was going to live for. But because of his actions, and you could say even selfish actions, we'll talk about that more next week, instead of being celebrated as a savior and deliverer yet, he was initially rejected, which caused him to flee for his own life. By the way, Acts chapter 7 lets us know that Moses spent 40 years, he's going to spend 40 years on his own in the wilderness in Midian, which at first glance seems like a really big waste of his life. But over the next several weeks, we're going to see how God strategically uses the 40 years in the wilderness to prepare Moses to lead the people of God for 40 years in the wilderness. But we'll talk more about that next week as we talk about his calling and preparation. But before we wrap today, here's what I want you to see how Exodus 2 ends. Verse 23. During that long period, this 40 years, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And God heard their groaning. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And so God looked on the Israelites 
and he was concerned about them. Last week, we talked about six things that really make up the Exodus story, themes, if you would, that we're going to look at and encounter as we read and study on our own each week, these themes of God and Jesus and salvation and mission and life and identity in Exodus. The, the first one, and arguably the most important, has to do with God and, again, specifically the character of God. And we see so much of that on display in these last verses here, in verses 23 to 25, we learn something about God's character, that he hears the groans and the cries of his people, that he looks and he remembers his promise, that, that he sees his people, that he is concerned about them. And that was certainly true for the Israelites who were suffering as slaves in Egypt then, but it's certainly true, and it's still true today for you and me, for any of us who longs to be set free from the pain and the suffering that is so often associated with this world that we find ourselves in. And, and here's what I hope. Here's what I hope begins today. And I realize we're still kind of in the who, what, when, where, why of Exodus. But here's what I hope we'll begin to see today in even greater ways in the coming weeks. We're going to see how God is going to raise up this Savior and Deliverer in Moses. But Moses is so much more than a great leader. His life for us really is meant to serve as a foreshadowing of Jesus, as God's ultimate and perfect Savior and Deliverer for each of us. And for those of you that know something of Jesus' life, I want you to just consider for a moment. We touched on these last week, some of the parallels and similarities between Moses' story and Jesus' story, that Moses came into a world where the people were oppressed by the Egyptians as Jesus walked into a world where the people were oppressed by the Romans. Moses was born into a world where baby boys were ordered killed by an evil Pharaoh. For Jesus, baby boys were ordered killed by an evil Herod. Moses is going to go into the wilderness for 40 years years as Jesus is going to spend 40 days in the wilderness himself. Moses will eventually lead the people through the sea and eventually to the Jordan River. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. Moses will go to Mount Sinai and receive the law. Jesus will eventually, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, go to a mountain where he is going to reinterpret Moses' law and what we know as the Sermon on the Mount that Moses, as we'll discover in a few weeks, was saved by the blood of the Passover lamb. Jesus is the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There are so many similarities in their story. It's no wonder why people call Exodus the gospel of the Old Testament. But there's at least one major difference between Moses and Jesus. Moses wasn't perfect. Or, yes, Moses wasn't perfect. He, he was flawed. He failed over and over again. Jesus, on the other hand, never failed. He lived a perfect life, a perfect death, so that when he died in our place and God raised him from the dead, he proved that he had the power to set you and me free from the slavery of sin and death once and for all, finally and forever. And as we begin this journey through the book of Exodus, I hope you'll be encouraged to see God's faithfulness, that he is the one that is capable, that must keep his promises, his promises to his people then, but still today, extends to us today through faith in Jesus Christ as God's promised Savior. Jesus sets us free from slavery to sin. He's our Passover lamb who rescues us from death so that like the Israelites, we can live with freedom as the people of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, for accounts like these, and most importantly, just further evidence of your character and grace and love and the reminders of your son, Jesus Christ who paid it all, who gave his life for us, Lord. And we thank you. We thank you for that. And I pray that today, even as we start, as we continue 
that for those of us that have put our faith and trust in him, that we will be encouraged as we walk away from here, as we're reminded of the faith and salvation and life that we have in Jesus. And then the life that we're called to is the people of God, that we, it is our responsibility, it's my responsibility to resemble the look like Jesus more and more each day. Would you help me to do that? Would you help us to do that? But I also pray that as maybe right now you're working on somebody's heart and life, that they might get a little clearer picture of Jesus today and a better picture of his love and your love, your love for us, your love for them. And the salvation and life that you offer to each person. He offers his life, his forgiveness to you. He's available to you. Father, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.